Hello, I am Pastor Dan Chapman of Cranberry Baptist Church. We are delighted that you have decided to watch one of our Sunday morning sermons. Watch and enjoy, but most importantly, learn from God's holy word and then apply its truth to your life. Let's go to God's word together. What? is the Great Commission all about? What is the main number one thing in the Great Commission? Someone answer. Make disciples, right? The number one thing that the church is to be about is making disciples. Amen? Whatever. All agree. What does that entail? I know Ken last week taught on the the need for discipleship, uh, and Ken, you'll have to you'll smile as I was uh, thinking up the title, and I love that word, the need for, and and I thought, oh, the need for discipleship went on there, and then that you stole it from me, you know? <laughs> no, I'm kidding, but um, the need for discipleship. But I want to talk to you today about disciple. What does that mean? And what does it look like? And I think you will be pleased. Whoops, I didn't mean to be going. The word disciple means a student, a learner, or a pupil. In the Bible, the word is used most often to refer to a follower of Jesus. In general, apostles refer to the small inner group of Jesus' followers. That would have been, of course, the original 12 and then the 11 after Judas messed up so bad. And then disciples refer to a larger group of Jesus' followers, such as the women who stood at the Jesus' cross and discovered the empty tomb. In other words, all the followers of, of Christ. And it has the idea or the thought that, that not only are you a follower of that person, but you take his ways, his truths, and that you put that, make you become like that person. And that is what it, it really, really refers to. In a verse in Acts 11, verses 25 and through 26, revival was beginning to break out in the city of Antioch. And when the, the Jewish leaders or the Christian leaders there in Jerusalem began to hear about it, they sent Barnabas up to them. In verse 25, then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, so that it was for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And before then, they were called believers, followers of the way. But the first time that the word Christian began to really be used, now who knows, someone may have said it, but as far as began to be referred to as the followers of Christ, as Christians happened at Antioch and at first and it really is almost a sense of a slave and it was really a, a as the town people began to call these it was not a nice term it was more of a derogatory term but the disciples were so pleased that they would be called a follower of Christ they began it began to become a badge of honor for them to be a Christian and what I want you to see with this verse is that the word disciples and the word Christians are used simultaneously. They are equal to. All Christians are be disciples and all Christians are, uh, uh, all disciples are be Christian. And that's what that passage is teaching us. A Christian is simply a follower of Christ. Not just a learner as in disciples. And I entitled this sermon, Ken, <laughs> instead of the need for discipleship, Discipleship 101. Now, if you've ever been to school, yeah, especially college, you'll know that a 101 class is the very beginning, the very basic. And that's where I get the 101. But Discipleship 101, and I want to read to you Luke 14, 26 through 33, though it's, I've left out some of those verses. Jesus is speaking and he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. 
and whosoever, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Then I've, the, it goes, I've skipped several verses and it talked about counting the cost. But verse 33 is a kind of a capstone to this whole thought. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he, forsake all that he has, cannot be my disciple. Now I want to explain a little bit on that. I don't believe God wants us to hate anybody, much less our family. But our love for God is to be so great. Now as you know, I love my sweet wife up here with, as humanly speaking, as much as I can. But I don't know that I've ever woke up, honey, at 3 a.m. and tried to read one of your love letters to me or any card that you said. I just, I would probably wait till a little later in the morning to get up and, and read a love letter from you. But I get up to read God's word. Amen. Because he is supreme. And that's what that word hate. It doesn't mean that we're to hate them literally, but that we're to love them. In fact, the Bible says that husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. But where's God in your love life? What is, where's the importance? And that's what Jesus is saying. This is not my words. These are Jesus' words. And then, yes, even your own life. And, and, and then he says in verse 27, you, who does not bear his cross? A cross is a place of death. And... Um, Dorothy shared in Sunday school and she quoted one of my favorite verses Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me and, and Jesus is teaching that here that we have a, a cross a purpose to live for and that's to serve him and then the, the third part is there, that we've to forsake all. Now, I don't think God has a problem with us having a home or having a car or having more than two suits, uh, uh, sets of clothes in our closet. But where's our heart? Discipleship starts right here. This part of it, and when I say that, that's just we refer the heart as the seat of our emotions. But discipleship starts with a love for Christ and a love to follow him and to be obedient to his will. Amen? And that's, that's the heart of Christianity. That's the heart of discipleship. If you don't start there, you'll miss the rest of it. And that to me, that if, you, if this, I could preach to long, but I felt like God wanted me to do something to use this as the springboard. There is so much there. And, it, it, and I don't know about you, but do you feel like that is a little bit overwhelming? Way beyond what you think you might be able to do? And for the average Christian, I think it is. But Jesus said, in other words, the whole context here is, I want you to be my disciple. I want you to love me. I want you to follow me and take up your cross. And I want you to forsake all to follow me and be obedient to me. Is that not what that passage is teaching? And it is. Discipleship. 101. This is where it starts. There has to be something within your... <laughs> I, I love NCIS on TV, and he starts and talks about it in your gut. I mean, it's in your heart. This, it starts here. It's just like loving another person. It starts in your heart. Then you act it out. You don't act. Now, some good actors, or if you're trying to get something, you might act out something, and the heart not be there. But, oh, day after day, it's going to start in the heart. Love comes from the heart. A love for God and a love for others. I want to go on. I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We are going to spend quite the rest of the service in 2 Timothy. And the reason I don't have anything else up there right now, while you're turning there, I want you to understand this is the Apostle Paul. He is writing a letter. This is his second letter to his son in the faith, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and he is literally going to disciple him. We will see a beautiful 
picture, example of what discipleship is really all about. You will hear things and see things as I think as we, and it'll scare Randy to death. I'm going to try to cover about two chapters today, Randy. Randy likes it me take about three or four verses. And I, 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 want to get the, I want to get the overview. I want to see the magnitude of what this discipleship, true discipleship is involved. So we're going to go quick because there's a lot here. But in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Verse 1 and 2, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promises of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now I want to go to verse 2. First it says, to Timothy. Really effective discipleship is either individual or one-on-one -on -one or one to a small group. I, I think it's hard. I think if this church was filled, let's just say this church, I had 100 people filled, sitting here in the pews right here this morning. I believe it would be very hard for me to disciple 100 people at one time. And that's my point. I think you have to be able to look people in the eye. You have to sense where they are. I know when we're doing our accountability groups, which is nothing but discipleship that I can see their eyes, they can see my eyes, they hear my heart, I hear their heart, and I can sense how God wants me to help them and encourage them, and I get to know them and them get to know me. And so it starts with a small group, or one-on-one. -on -one. Then he says, a beloved son. I love people, you know that. I, I'm just, I, I'm a hugger, I, I love people, I just, it's like me falling off a log. It's just who I am. But let me tell you something. I first started with Steve and Randy, and now Jeremy and Ken. And after you've sat week after week praying for one another, encouraging one another, there's a law that develops. You see, he says, beloved son, these are my beloved brothers. And as I pour my heart into them and I see God begin to grow them, wow, what a joy that brings. To me, but it brings a joy to them because they are beginning to realize what God, this serving thing of, of God is. I don't believe a person can grow unless you really get that discipleship. Now, with that, with one exception, I believe with enough time that you can do it without someone, but it's a lot harder. And the reason I say that, I never had anybody disciple me, never had anybody sit down with me one on one or in a small group and began to teach me. I just had to get in there and dig it out. And you know what? I made some mistakes. I bet some of you have too. But discipleship takes someone, hopefully in that, that group, that's got a little more, a little further down the road spiritually, that's helping them to grow and, and, and kind of taking them by the hand. And Come on, let's go. And here's how we do it. Let's memorize this passage and do that. But Timothy, a beloved son. And the next, if you look at verse 5, then Paul says, I, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you. It starts with, you must be born again and you must have the Holy Spirit in you. It's the same, just saying it differently. For discipleship to take place, a person has to be saved. A person has to have the Holy Spirit in them. The Holy Spirit has to do the work. And all I am is just like right now, I'm teaching through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, letting God work in me and through me and teaching you things. But if you're ever going to disciple somebody, that person has to be saved. Now that may sound like kind of trite, but it has to be said. Verse 8, and the next thing that Paul goes to, and again, I'm just going to verse, and I'm not looking at every verse. But I, I want you to understand, Paul is teaching this beloved son in the faith a, a, what it means to be discipled. And one of the things, first you need to be saved. Secondly, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me of his prisoner. But share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. The, my point here is, don't be ashamed of who you are in Christ. You say, well, Dan, I know that. Well, let me, let's, put, let's put shoes on that or feet to the ground on that. What if someone says, I, don't, I think Christians are a bunch of junk. I don't believe all that stuff. What are you going to do? I'll tell you what I'll do. 
I'll stand up and tell them about my Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell them about the God in heaven, my creator that loved me and gave his life on the cross of Calvary for me. I'm not going to be ashamed. And the world is in need of people that will stand up and say, I am a Christian. I am a follower of Christ. And I'll die for it. Discipleship. True followers of Christ will stand up and be a witness. I think every missionary that's ever went on every foreign mission field, especially the, the jungle type, a lot of them have given their lives for the name of Christ. They had rather died than deny Christ. Paul dies later for the name of Christ. Discipleship is learning to deny self and not being ashamed. Listen, get excited about this one that lives within you. Get excited about the joy of Christ and the power of Christ. Now, I, I, I've said this before, but I feel like I need to say it again. The great um, leader of India of many years ago was Gandhi. And he studied all the religions of the world. And he said, Christianity has the greatest of all the teachings. But it cannot be true because I do not see it in, his, in the followers of Christ. If Christians will stand up and let this be their rule book and let this tell them what is right and wrong and live according to this, be a disciple, we can change the world. Verse 9 says, I, I jumped, I apologize, I didn't realize time hit the button. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Do you realize that when that day came and God the Holy Spirit dealt with your heart about the sin in your life and your need to be saved, God was calling you with a holy calling, bringing you to, br to be born again, to bringing you into the family of God. That was an act of God because he has a purpose for you. He has a plan for you and he wants you to live the Christian discipled life. And so Paul talking to Timothy says this whole thing about discipleship. Your beginning was to be saved, but then you were called um, with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Do you realize that you have a, God has a plan for you? And I don't care if we had a little baby here, if that little baby of the Bartlett's was here. God has a plan for a little McKay, McKenna page. He has a plan for all of us. A purpose. You know what gets me out of bed in the mornings? That purpose. That I'll be pleasing to my God and my King. Discipleship is having that heart. Discipleship is wanting, knowing that I'm called to the holy calling. And I have a purpose that God has given. And look at that last sentence. Was given to us in Christ Jesus when? Before time began. I'm looking back here at Randy, back there at the sound booth. Randy, God called you, or knew he was going to call you, you just didn't know it yet, before time ever began. He knew you by name. He knew your parents and your grandparents and all the little... Here. God has a purpose for Randy, but you know what? That's for all of us. This whole thing of discipleship is learning what that calling and what that purpose is all about. Verse 13, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And the words hold fast, it means to grip, to grasp, and hold on. There's a commercial on about, uh, it's a, uh, one of these big ships, uh, cruise ships out in the, and Joanne doesn't like heights and she doesn't like uh, carnival rides and that kind of a thing. And it's got this lady doing the zip line, you know, where you hang from this one thing and she's going, I said, Joe, would you like to do that? Of course, I know on good and well, she would hate that. You'd have to strap her in, have her chained down, and she would hate you all the way across that thing. I promise you, she'd probably never speak to you again because she'd be so afraid. But I guarantee you, if, 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 if that you did get her on it, and it went across there, she would be holding fast to that rope or chain or whatever. Now, you're buckled in, and you can't fall, but hold fast. 
hold fast hold fast and by the way it's an imperative verb it's a command hold fast to want the pattern of sound words which is simply another way of saying the word of God those that what is the right teachings do you realize that we live in a land there's a lot of false teaching around and if you don't know the truth you're going to hold fast to the unsound words we need to make sure we know who's who's teaching us and that's what it says you have heard of me and that's the reason I underline that we're going to touch on that again a little bit later but Paul is warning Timothy and his the discipling him to to hold fast the, my teachings as I want to see you grow why because I love you and I care about you you have a purpose a plan verse 14 that good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us I am so glad it's not me so much holding fast it is the Holy Spirit of God in me and as I'm allowing the Holy Spirit work in me and then through me it's him that gives me the strength to hold I don't know about you, but I've <laughs> I've done quite a bit of work and lifting things and everything and, and doing some even mechanic. I don't know, but I have been underneath the car, and I hate this, but I can do it. Uh, if you ever pulled a tr now, ladies, I'm not talking to you so much, but guys, you ever pulled a transmission out of a car? I tell you what you're doing now. If you don't have the jacks like the mechanic shops do, what that literally means is you get you you get to slide it up, and it's almost resting on your chest, and you got to push that rascal up and then you've got to get the pins to slip in there just right and you've got a bolt, a nut I mean to, to, that's sticking through it and you finally get that and you, you hold it with one hand you finally get one nut the Holy Spirit I get fatigued when I do that I have actually had to just set it back down on my chest for a few months and get my arms untingling but it's the Holy Spirit in me it's the Holy Spirit in me that gives me the strength that dwells in me to the, that was committed to me not speaking of salvation then chapter 2 verse 1 you therefore my son be strong in the grace <laughs> if I tried to do 10 push ups in front of you right now I would be in a world of hurt but I can remember a day I could give, show you 50. That was in the days of the army many years ago. But I could do 50 push-ups. Now some of you may be able to do 50 still yet. Um, but strength comes from use. The more I read the holy word of God and the more I let God speak to me, the more I let God's word dwell in me richly, I'm stronger. I don't get up to read my Bible to say I've read so many chapters today. I get up to meet with God and let his word wash me and cleanse my heart. Be strong in the grace. If you're ever going to be discipled and become that disciple that God wants us to become, and he does, because he has a plan and a purpose, is that we'll become strong. I would even say, go with this for that if you're not strong in Christ and not growing and becoming stronger you're in sin I don't mean to throw rocks it's, my goal here is not to, to, to throw rocks at you and beat you down but I'm telling you that God wants you to be strong it says be strong again it's that be verb and it's, that, it's an imperative tense type be strong in the grace and God gives us the grace the power to become strong I read a statistic, oh gosh, it's been probably a year ago or better. And I was reading about how, why we're losing our young people in Christendom. Why is Christian homes and families that when the kids get older, they're gone. And it's a huge percentage. And then some of that percentage that leave come back like in their 30s and 40s. Well, usually when they start having kids, they see how hard it is. They need, it. <laughs> they need help. But why do we lose so many? It's because we have not discipled our children and where they are strong. And when they go out into the world and the world has all the tentacles and all the, the, the draw to them to get them away from the teachings of Christ. 
that they can say, I know better. And they can stand and talk with wisdom. We must disciple our children. We must disciple one another. We must become strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever failed God and said, oh, why did I do that? And here, I'm a, I raise both hands. I have. It's because at that moment in my life, I was not walking with Christ like I should have been. But the longer I walk with him, the stronger I become. Those times are less. And I can confess to you today, joyfully, my stumbles are a lot less. And in fact, I can even say to you, they're very getting very rare. But I have to be on my toes. And it's because my daily walk with Christ. And it's that discipleship. And, and listen, unless you decide you want to be taught... And I want to say this right up front. If there's a man here that wants to be taught, I promise you, I will meet with you every week. I don't know when, but we'll figure out a time and do it. I'm meeting right now on Saturday mornings with Ken and, and Jeremy, but I, I'll meet with you some other time. Why? And, and Joanne will meet with you and some of you ladies. And we will, we will do things to help you to grow and to be disciples. But you've got to want to. Verse 2, and the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others so also. And why do I put this in there? It's so key. Because if you begin to disciple, you need to begin to learn that you can begin to teach others. If I disciple you, I'm looking at Steve. Steve, I have discipled you. I worked with you for, oh, what, a year plus, whatever it was. One of the goals that I had, I didn't do it just for you. I wanted to see Christ in you so great that you would be reaching others for Christ and that you would disciple the next group. In fact, when I, I got to that point with you and Randy, you both were ready. You didn't need me. That's when I said to Jeremy and Ken, guys, let's start meeting. You need to be reaching out. You don't get discipled for you. You get discipled to glorify God by reaching others. Amen? Discipleship. It's not just coming to getting saved. It's not just coming and being baptized and coming and sitting. It is following the Lord, being strong in the Lord, being a witness for the Lord. Why are our churches failing? It's because we do we are so weak. By the way, on that, and I forgot to say this while ago, on that survey I was reading a uh, years plus ago, where they said the number one reason when they interviewed a lot of these kids that grew up in Christian homes, why did you leave the church? And they said, Well, the teaching did not match up with what I saw in the church. I hear about the power of God and I see no power in the, in the Christians. Even in my own parents, some of them said. It's all high and lifted up and it's all great when you enjoy it. But where is it today? That's the reason they're leaving. They see no presence and power of God. And I say to you as a church member, if you, some, I've got several grandpas and grandmas here. Let even not only your grandchildren see it, but their friends, when whoever you come to, let there be such a glow of the presence of God in your life that when something happens, I was ready to start praying for that little baby yesterday. We went to the hospital believing that we didn't know, I mean, that we was going to hear just within a few minutes after we got there that the baby was okay. But Joanne and I got, went there to not only comfort Jeremy and Nicole, but to pray for that little baby and to pray for healing. Would you have done that? Would you have embarrassed yourself or at least the opportunity to pray for God to touch that baby that would have, they thought a tumor was on the back of its eye? I'm simply saying the world needs to see the reality of Christ. That only comes through discipleship. Growing and becoming strong. We have a world to reach. We have a world to reach. And we have to commit these things. Paul taught Timothy. He wanted Timothy and he wanted to pour, so pour his life into Timothy that Timothy could find faithful men and that those faithful men would be so discipled by Timothy that they would be reaching others. Four generations of people. That is discipleship. 
And then he comes up and he gives Timothy a warning. You therefore must endure hardship. That's in the word of God, people. That's right out. The reason I want you to open your Bibles today is I want you to see it in black and white. You therefore must endure hardships. Monday morning when I was doing the service for Eddie, my oldest brother that had passed. It was exactly what I thought when I got talking about him in the obituary and the reading of that and kind of talking about his life. I stood and wept before everybody. I couldn't. I had to just stop talking, get control, and try to talk a little bit more. And then I had to do it all over again a couple of times. But the moment that I took the pulpit, God was there. And no one walked out of that building not knowing how to come to know Christ. And how to know that they know that they have Christ and would have the gift of eternal life. I'm simply saying it was a hardship at that moment, but listen, it was also a joy. And it says, and then he gives us four examples of enduring hardship as a good soldier, number one, of Christ, Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to talk about the soldier. No one entangles in a warfare, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Now, I was in the army. I came that close, as I told you that, going to Vietnam. The, when it was hot and heavy and they stopped they only sent the ones that volunteered not the, the drafted and that's what I was but I would have went and I would have done a good job I guarantee you that if I had been in battle and if I looked at my sergeant or my captain or whoever and said listen guys this is getting kind of hot I think I'll go to Tahiti for a couple of days or I, I need to go home and build a house. Or whatever it is. The biggest reason that most Christians are not allowing themselves to be disciples is this. They're too busy with life to serve God. It's just the way it is. We, we get so busy. When you look at your schedule, listen, when you, you, you need to write down on your calendar every day a put God in there somewhere now for me it's first thing in the morning I don't have it on my calendar it's just there it's right here and right here we have to make time we cannot be so caught up into this life that we forget what we need to be doing for Christ verse 5 and also competes in the athletics he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules I promise you the best runner if he cuts short and has less room to run even though he may finish the get across the finish line first he's disqualified the man that wins the race is the man that does it according to the rules and being first and then the last one is a hard working farmer must be first to be must be first to partake of the crops uh, I didn't have a big farm Joanne grew up on a farm I think it was 160 acres and she she knows what that is but I do remember a lot of days, all long days, um, cutting weeds out of fields, um, feeding hogs, milking cows. I mean, I, I really grew up on a small farm, and we had it all. That is hard labor. I know one time, one summer, I worked, helped a man put up hay. We put it, we bailed, we put up hay in the, the hay loft in the cool of the morning, 300 bales him and I and then in the evening we would bail three more hundred bales to put up the next morning and that was all summer long lifting heavy bales of, um, of hay hard working farmer first three are you willing to endure hardships you know what I don't know about you but I found life gives us hardships regardless In Christ, walking with Christ, those hardships are not near as hard as they were. Because it's Christ living in me and through me. Amen? And that's what I want to share with you. But you, we, we sometimes will think, oh, that's too hard for me. I, 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 Just say, God, what do you want? You'll give me the strength, believing that he will do it for you. 
Verse 10. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect that they may obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The reason I gladly endure the hardships is that I can tell others about Jesus Christ. This past week I went to Lowell's here in town or I guess it's still here in town, it's in Mars or whatever it is, over just across the, the interstate. And uh, there was a checkout lady there and I got to talk to her about the Lord. She wasn't in church. You know what I mean? I had a witness. Just so easy. Just someone standing there. And so I gave her a card. She's looking for a church. So I haven't been to church in a long time and I know I need to get back. Perfect opportunity. Decide. You, you look for things. You look for opportunities. You know, if we're not going to serve, why doesn't God just take us on home? Verse 11, this is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. Speaking of that living sacrifice of Romans 12, 1. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. Someday, someday I will stand before my God. And I believe this. If, as long as I stay on the path I'm on, I believe this. I'm going to hear Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant, enter to the joy of the Lord. Do you want that? Now see, we all want that. But are you willing to be discipled and stop living for yourself and living for him? Just about done. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words of no profit to the ruin of hear hearers, and I'll come back to verse 15 that's next but shun profane and idle babblings for they will increase to more ungodliness and their message will spread like cancer as many times I read the scripture I don't guess I've ever seen that using cancer as an illustration but anyway sometimes people want to get in arguing of the little stuff you know I believe that baptism should be for believers only I'll die on that one and I believe that baptism should be by immersion. But if, if I can have good fellowship with a Methodist or Presbyterian that sprinkles their babies, I really can't. And so let's don't get so caught up in the, the, the little the issues of life. Verse 15 that, that I skipped, this is, this, it's like another thought within of those thoughts. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth you've got to know the word you've got to know the word I read this Bible because I want to hear from God this, I've read a lot of books in my life my goodness I've got 142 college hours and 96 graduate hours I've read a lot of books not counting all the books I've read in the ministry since 1970 or 76. This is the only one I come back to. This is God speaking. This is God speaking to Dan Chaffin. And I want so much, God, what do you want to do with my life? Where, what do you want me to do? What is my purpose? How do I live it? What is about this? What about that? And letting God's word teach me. Verse 19, I'm going to quickly get through this. The main part is what I've got it underlined. Verse um, 19, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Until Christian, part of discipleship is staying away from sin. If, if, if I'm working with someone that has an alcohol problem, let's say, then I'm going to tell that person to stay out of the bars. Don't go, don't go running with your buddies that are drinkers. I mean, if you want to grab a lunch at a, at a diner where there's no alcohol, that's fine. But don't run with people that are where your weakness is. If a man has a, is, is, is having a problem with, with today, society, pornography, then you need to be very careful what you click on 
this morning at church I went on and checked the emails of our church here and there was one of those letters that says click on and hear my private message and it had you could tell by the way it was it was pictures I mean I had right here in an office at the church could have clicked on one click looked at pornography it's that easy that makes me mad by the way I think it all you'd have to pay somebody to even look at a lot of that stuff that you know you were little kids can't get into it let everyone who names the name of depart from iniquity their house discipleship starts with a hate or desire to hate sin and a hatred towards that which is pulling me back towards the things that are not according to God's purpose in my life then it says therefore if anyone cleanses himself from the latter talking about uh, being uh, things that are, are temporary he will be a vessel for honor sanctified and useful for the master prepared for every good work if we realize if we hate sin we need to get clean before him and stay that way two, two quick thoughts flee from youthful lust and then what here's a don't but then what the, then the do is but pursue righteousness faith love peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart you see when you hunger for God's righteousness in your life when you hunger for for walking in faith and being strong in Christ when you walk in, in loving others and caring about others and where, where they are in life and then caring about having God's peace in your heart and not so much troubled and, and anxious all the time you're there but you have to pursue it you have to want it you have to long for it um, that a servant Lord must not quarrel and I have underlined several things here we're going to quickly because as a servant of Christ I'm not to quarrel I'm to be gentle I'm to be able to teach others and I can't teach if I don't know it I'm to be patient in humility correcting those who are in opposition and then I put the word why in why giving you tell you why you need to not be quarrelsome and need to be gentle and all that if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will the world is looking for someone to say I found the way a peace and joy and in the gift of eternal life. Come with me. I will show you. I will teach you. The, the world. Usually it's when they've just struggled. And struggled and struggled with sin in their life. And they finally come up. I don't want to live this world. Someone help me. That's when you can disciple them. Because they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Of failure in their life. And, and, and I've just seen it. I just know it. it and the but know this in the last days perilous times will come you think it's tough now every day we get closer to the second coming of Christ it's going to get worse and it says you have carefully followed my doctrine in other words he's really closing it up now with Timothy but again he says you have carefully followed my teachings that's word doctrine manner of life you've watched me Timothy my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my love, my perseverance, the persecutions, the afflictions which happened to me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. Now listen, what persecutions I endured and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Let's, let's just finish. In verse 14 it says, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned discipleship doesn't happen overnight uh, if I would ask the four guys I don't know about you guys I would think that it took about a year about a year of weekly meeting and a weekly of memorizing scriptures and, and, and discussing scriptures and talking about it and encouraging it took about a year to really build some of those deep things in people's lives discipleship does not happen overnight it's a process and you need to be careful who you're learning them from 
I'm going to quickly come to close. Why did I share this? You know, if you're sitting here today with a heart not really wanting to walk with God, then you're probably a little bit upset at me because I've really got in your face, and it was not my heart to get in your face. When I walk down the street, if you think, it, statistically, just in the greater Pittsburgh area, I've, I've heard and read different percentages, but I think it's fair to say less than 10% of Christ, people living in the greater Pittsburgh area is evangelical, which really preach Christ crucified and it must put your faith and trust. It teaches must you must be born again. That If that percentage is true, and we'll just say that, that means only 10 out of every 100 people you meet is probably a Christian. Think about that. Now, if that percentage is true, now what am I saying? Discipleship is not for you so much other than the preparation to be what you want to be, need to become. But it's to go out to the harvest. It's having a harvest. I can't, you don't, can't see it because of my long sleeve shirt, but I, and most I've shared this with you before, every time I see that little rubber bracelet and I, by the way, I don't like it in the sense I don't, I'm not that kind of, I don't like these kinds of things. But I wish you would know how many times I've prayed for the lost people of the world every time I see that. It helps keep in my mind there's a harvest. There's people going to hell every moment of every day. People are dying without Christ. And who's going to tell them? It'll only be those that have, that have grown and learned and become what God wants. That's discipleship. That's the reason Jesus said, make disciples, church. Yes, teach them. Yes, baptize in the name of the Father, the name of the, uh, the God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, we need to do those things, but you've got to bring them to Christ, and then you've got to spend time bringing them to a greater depth of learning that they may go reach out. Now, I I'm not going to say how, ask how old everybody is here, but I know one thing. Every year I get older, Zines, a little less time, I'm going to have to work the harvest. I grew up enough with farming to know this. If you, you plowed the fields and you dissed the fields and you, you planted the seed and then you prayed for rain and, 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 did, and watched it grow, but you didn't leave it in the field. You went and harvested it. And God says, Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into my field. Who's going to be the la better laborers? Those that have been trained to know how to go out. That is discipleship. And one of the things I have come to decide, and I pray that you have the same heart that I do, but we are, as Cranberry Baptist Church, going to become a discipling type church. We are not going to let the, the, the fields go wide into harvest around us without us trying to do everything we can to reach the harvest. Because it is the harvest that Jesus died. It is the harvest that's what this is all about. It's not whether I'm happy or whether I have hardships. It's whether I am out in the fields working to see more people come to Christ and then grow them and teach them and get a bigger army. Amen? That is my heart. That is, how, that is what gets me up in the morning anymore. It's not to just have church. Church appears three times in the Gospels. The word church. Only three. And two of them talks about church discipline. And I forget now, but it's like 300, 400 times the, the words kingdom of God, the kingdom of, of Christ, and those kinds of things. It, it's hundreds of times. We need to be concerned about the kingdom. Bringing people to Christ. That is the heart of Christianity. It is the heart of discipleship. Let's pray. Father, it's a hard message. A very hard message. Because it said, I must die to myself and my wants to become what you want me to become that I can be a harvester that I can be that my life will count 
when the counting's done. Lord, it's, I'm not going to really give an invitation. But I want you to speak to every heart that is here. That each and every one of us would ask, what am I doing for the kingdom? And what can I do to better prepare myself to bring more people to the harvest? Some, it's kind of late in the day for them. But Lord, you could, they can become great prayer warriors. Father, they can be the ones that just really, really pray. Where they're crying out day and night for the souls of men to be saved and boys and girls and grandpas and grandmas Father then they can do some of the things Lord they can't get out and walk up and down the streets and up and down steps like they once could have but Father they can pray Father for the younger group that still have our strength Father use us show us how you want us to be used in the harvest and discipling other workers. And Lord, help us to raise our young in a ways that they have a heart to serve you, that they will have a purpose, that they will be soon be joining our ranks of being a true Christian, a follower of the teachings of Christ. Lord, let, us, let this message burn in our hearts. And I pray, oh God, I pray that we'll take it and make it a part of our lives. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to one of our sermons today. We pray that it was a blessing and a time of learning. If we can ever be of service to you or you would like to know more about us, please check out our website at cranberrybaptist.org. May God richly bless you.